again. Welcome back to Game Rave TV. May 29th, 1999. It's a day that so many people would like to forget, one that others lament, and a moment that YouTubers who thrive on being angry at all things thank the heavens for. That day was the initial release date of the new Superman Adventures, or more commonly known as Superman 64. Few games in history have the reputation that Superman 64 has, and its development history is one buried in disasters, problems, and involuntary design choices. In an interview with multiple sources, Titus founder Eric Kane admitted that the two main problems with the development were that they were too ambitious for the system hardware, and the rest was surrendered to DC Comics and Warner Brothers' creative control. What makes the situation more tragic is that the cartridge isn't alone. The game was originally planned to have a PlayStation release as well sometime after the N64 version. Based on the PlayStation's hardware limitations, however, some minor changes would have had been made. This included removing the entire outside city sequence, and the rings, reducing Superman's adventures to nothing but indoor events. To add more problems to the PlayStation woes, according to internet sources, the events of the Columbine School Massacre, which happened a month prior to the N64 version's public release, would see DC Comics and Warner Bros. demanding that all human villains and real-world weapons be removed from the final PlayStation product. It was okay for Superman to punch real folks in the cartoon, but here in the video games, he'd have to stick to virtual villains. That meant that Sony's release of Superman was going to be a completely different beast from its original incarnation on Nintendo. And if Titus and developer Blue Sky were going to have any chance of repairing the situation, they'd have to do it fast. More on that later in the video. For now, let's dive into the game. With the prototype being made available to an outsider for the first time, I wanted to provide the ultimate reference guide for everyone involved. That meant tearing into every little corner of the game, mapping out the controls, and assisting in getting around limitations of the prototype. Like any good full retail release, let's start with Superman's controls. Alright, you'll be using the controller in standard mode, with almost every button having a function. Starting with the basics. Up and down will move our hero forward and back, while left and right will turn him in the appropriate directions. Hitting select will cause the game's resolution to switch back and forth, while the start button pauses the game. Here in the pause menu are a cornucopia of developer tools, tricks, and notes. The most amusing being that the camera angles are called default, dad, and dumbass. There is supposedly a way to turn off Superman's clipping or make him invincible, but I couldn't get anything to work. I'll leave this section for the more technically minded. Over on the thumb buttons, X is used for punching, interacting with in-game characters and objects, and advancing dialogue boxes. Circle will spin Superman 180 degrees, Triangle allows you to switch between his abilities, and Square allows him to use his abilities. The shoulder buttons are assigned in size. The left shoulder buttons will move Kal-El up and down and in and out of his flight mode. The right shoulder buttons will make him dodge left and right to help avoid those pesky kryptonite bullets, and as you can see, the dodges also work in air. Speaking of flight, there's some sort of air punch air dash that he can destroy enemies with, but it's not consistent in gameplay, so I left it out here. Going back to Superman's abilities, he has the option of super speed, which he uh, momentarily pauses and then takes off. He also has his heat vision, which he'll use mainly to burn up robots. And then he's got his freeze breath. The freeze breath is what you'll use to solve puzzles. Um, you can freeze uh, spider webs, um, blocks, walls, and make them brittle enough to break them. In one instance, you'll also need it to freeze a switch to keep a door open. It's also extremely important to note that civilians are susceptible to Superman's powers. If you accidentally aim wide with the heat beam, you can unintentionally kill an NPC. And if you do, it's end of the level and the player must restart from scratch. If Superman is hit by an enemy's kryptonite bullet or anything else covered in the element, Superman loses all of his powers and gains a health bar. If he is hit while under the influence of kryptonite, he will only have 3-4 to four chances to regain his strength back or he dies. While waiting for the effects to wear off, he will only be able to walk and punch at a much lower damage scale. Where he could once knock out an enemy in two punches, it could now take up to ten. Along the way, you'll find two types of power-ups, timer bonus and power bonus. The timer bonuses are gold in color and add a set amount of seconds back on the clock, usually in 15 second increments. The silver power-up improves Clark's abilities. These come in double and triple flavor, but disappear if old red cape gets hit. In my playthroughs, I only came across two or three of these total. Finally, there are in-world objects that, for the most part, would probably have been handy in a final release, 
but here in the prototype they don't do much, and in one case, you don't even know what it is. The objects will come across like a dumpster or the crate. Those are able to be picked up and thrown at people. The previously mentioned mystery comes later in the game when an NPC gives you something that will help you, but it's never visually explained what the item was. They just tell you you now have it. Level-specific triggers, switches, and machines will all come into play as well, mostly used for opening doors or lowering shields. One of the more confusing ones is a small yellow laser beam found in certain doorways. If you walk through them and they turn blue, they'll activate or deactivate a room in the area. With controls and objects now out of the way, it's time to cover the levels. As mentioned earlier in the video, the PlayStation version was supposed to have been a port of the Nintendo 64 code, and from that you can see the influence it had on this known iteration of the game. If we compare the level listings next to each other and then remove the city levels, you can see the developers didn't sway too far from the original plans. Essentially swapping out Nintendo's warehouse and parking lot stages for a mine and an underground garage, the flow of levels is a bit more streamlined. On a humorous note, it was clear that the designers really didn't know what to do with Jimmy Olsen and Lois Lane. Both characters need rescuing from their barely plot-driven appearances, acting as little more than the flagpole in Super Mario Brothers. Jimmy from the mine, and Lois from the subway station. It would be wise to bring a paper and pen with you to map out the levels, because rescuing both characters requires you to backtrack halfway through the stage to the uh, exit you found earlier. Let's break down each level. Leading in the stages out of the gate is the damaged mine. This is both the first stage of the game and the one automatically loaded by the system. If you would like to skip around, simply press start and use the first line to select your stage of choice. While the majority of level names are easy to understand, Para Boss is short for Parasite Boss Level. It should be also noted that this option does not list the stages in their proper sequential order. For that, please refer to the notes in the description section of the video or our write-up on GameRave.com. Here in the mines, players will have their work cut out for them since each tunnel in the mine is sealed off by a Kryptonian force field. Superman's first objective is to start rescuing all the workers, some who are trapped by robot soldiers, and others who have been caught in the literal and physical webs of mechanical spiders. It's here that the game's first mission type is revealed, the Timed Rescue. Each section gives you a set amount of time to rescue a specific number of miners. Each of these minigames moments going forward will require three possible tasks. Eliminate all the local enemies, rescue people from their traps, or stop an inanimate object from exploding. Rescuing specific workers will also trigger switches, allowing you to reach the other legs of the mine. Once you have all the workers safe, you just need to rescue Jimmy and fly to the level's exit door. On to fuel. With one natural resource finally saved, it's time to move on to the next one with fuel. Turns out giant gas tanks don't like being set on fire, so Clark needs to get inside the facility to once again rescue the workers and stop the tanks from exploding. Here, the timed minigames continue, but are now on a much grander scale. One of the earliest missions requires you to put out fires on two giant fuel tanks in two separate areas and then get to the workers before time runs out. Players will need to fly up or down the fuel tank's massive side and use their ice breath to extinguish the fires. Late in the stage, Ice Breath will also be used to freeze giant turbines to stop an electrical flow that is blocking a worker's path. The camera angle can get extremely wonky in the fuel tank areas, so you'll have to move fast and know exactly where the fire spouts are. Once again, you'll need to carry Jimmy out via an exit. Ah, uh, Jimmy. Always getting into trouble. Back to the dam. Once our pesky photographer is safe again, along with all the fuel burning, the next resource to worry about is water, so it's off to the dam. Here's where some of the game's creativity really shines. The level is split between above water and below water sequences. When underwater, Clark automatically dons a snazzy scuba suit that woefully also limits his abilities to just super speed. Tasks here will include finding and rescuing dam workers, disarming bombs that have been set up throughout the reservoir, and deactivating fans preventing you from moving in certain tunnels. This stage features some of the most vibrant colors in the game, and despite the oddity in the enemy jellyfish animations, the best use of space and design layout can be found here. Just be aware that several of the needed goals are in vertical passageways, which aren't always visible right away. They're easy to miss in the flow of things. Once the bombs are defused and the workers save, the computer is safely shut down and it's off to LexCore. The Garage So being in Metropolis means that if there are nefarious things going on, it's more than likely Lex Luthor is up to something. The next stage takes you to the parking garage of LexCore, which would more than likely be explained away as being needed since Superman can't travel outside in the Kryptonian green fog. 
or in this case, the actual city, because it's gone. Here in the underground, robot soldiers and sneaky door switches will be your main villains. Like all the other places, you'll need to rescue trapped parking attendants since Lex doesn't offer hazard pay for his part-timers. New to the bag of tricks are laser door switches. Small, thin yellow lines that once cross will trigger a door to open or close. Late in the level, you'll need to fly over a bunch of them to get out alive. It's also an area ripe with power-ups, so be sure to snag them. As a gameplay tip, one of the door switches will require you to activate it and then freeze the console so the button stays pressed. Once you get your parking stub validated, it's time to head up to the Lex Luthor's office. With the problem being, the office is empty. The office level is essentially fully rendered, but it's completely barren of characters or items. There's also a peculiar problem in that the second floor is literally upside down. I don't know if this was a programming issue or a somehow plot element, but once you find your way to the third floor and Luther's portrait, there's not much else to do. Use the pause screen to load up the next sequential stage, which is the subway. Ah, the subway. I don't mean the restaurant. This was probably the most wonderfully decorated stage with the lowest amount of believability in the game. If this were a real subway station, people would never be seen from again, as there are endless corridors that don't lead to any trains. Not to mention, the fire door doesn't lead out of the building. <laughs> You're kind of trapped. Lois Lane is your main rescue here, along with several other folk. The opening area is more of the same as you've seen before, but the back end of the level shows off the amount of destruction Parasite's been causing before Superman got there. Lots of damaged trains, a few fires, destroyed walls, and more dot the landscape. This is one of the few stages that had a true hidden, though fairly obvious, hostage to rescue. You need to break through a damaged wall to find him. Once you sort that out and get Lois out of there, the only real boss fight in the prototype occurs. Parasite. Unlike the, if you'll pardon the pun, bizarro fight you had to deal with in the original N64 version, Parasite's boss stage and fight was pretty straightforward here. Trapped between a door and smashed trains, Parasite's main ability is to steal yours, and in doing so, he regains all of his health back. Had his artificial intelligence been fully realized, it's assumed the main play angle would have been constantly dodging him grabbing you and stealing your abilities while you hit him with the freeze breath or the heat beam. As it stands on the prototype, once you have him locked on, it's pretty much game over in about 5 seconds. Defeating Old Purple Face will bring you to the last two sections of the prototype, launching Superman back into outer space. The Space Station. Stuck aboard Brainiac's giant spaceship, Superman dons a snazzy spacesuit which, just like the scuba gear, reduces him to just using his super speed. Trapped aboard the ship with scientists and the largest robots in the prototype, Superman must activate all the air vents to blow away Kryptonian elements and create oxygen for the humans aboard. It's here where what little of available storyline finally appears and pulls everything together. It turns out Lex Luthor was raiding all the earlier stage resources to use them as trade bait for Brainiac's space technology. Spread throughout the ship are memory orbs of Brainiac's previous experiences. These act as the collectible requirement for the stage, but not melt, that don't do much else. And were it not for a glitched set of enemies, would actually end up finishing the stage. Wolfly, that's where the prototype essentially ends, as the true final stage you can select, select is the Brainiac boss fight, but it's not programmed. It's included here for pretty much posterity only. And with that, gamers now have a complete overview of the game, which you can enjoy, Jason Free, after this episode by watching my full 90 minute let's play of it afterwards in its own video. So obviously the game is going to have its bug problems, but there are actually two ways around the chaos caused by the unfinished camera angles. The first trick is a beautiful use of an oversight in the programming. Superman's abilities are tied to the square button, but his punch and accept commands are on X. In any minigame, it forces you into a timed element, so long as you don't ever press X to accept the rules, the timer never starts. So you can now use the super abilities to take care of all the enemies on screen, and once all the obstacles are removed, you can press X to interact with the hostages and free them well within the now active time limit. If you have a GameShark Pro, you can also freeze the timer. Wait for the time to be 59 seconds or less, then pause the game and remember what the time was. Activate your GS Pro hacking software and do a known search for that number. Exit back to the game, let the timer count down a bit more, then do another known search for that new number. You'll eventually get a possibility chance of three or four code lines. Move all the lines that come up to the active side, edit all of them to be 59, and once you're done and exit back, you'll have an infinite timer. It's important to note that each timer is a different memory address, so you'll need to hack it every time you want to. 
Whew. After all that, let's get down to the nitty gritty. The million dollar question, did we as a gaming community lose something of value? Yes. Empathetically, hypothetically, and absolutely yes. It's very rare for a lamented video game to get a second chance in life. Tyus and Blue Sky Software took critical feedback of their game during a time when there was no such thing as instant feedback or console game patching and tried to correct their source material. This path would lead them through essentially three incarnations of the PlayStation version, and what they tried to accomplish is tangible in the prototype. What was once a foggy, washed out, and mind-numbing experience has been replaced with vibrant colors and rich hues and actual playability. Superman is no longer a Simon Says playstyle, but more of his own speedrun against the built-in timers. Level design is more thought out, using multiple paths and vertical areas to allow Clark some room to explore, rather than just flying through some rings. Admittedly, I can't fully review a prototype since it's an eternally a work in progress, but there's one part of the game I'd like to focus on that helps explain one of the biggest problems with Superman as a video game character in general. The guy is a walking, talking game shark code. In his purest form, bullets bounce off him, he has x-ray vision, he can fly, and according to lore, he's so strong he's been known to accidentally leave finger indents in objects. How as a game designer are you supposed to get around that? This struggle has been with Superman through every game he's ever soloed, with many designers deciding to weaken his abilities or make them power-ups, which defeats the purpose of being freaking Superman. Titus' second take on it was almost perfect except for the fatal flaw I alluded to on Twitter. Having already stripped Clark of his true flying abilities by trapping him inside buildings, the act of completely locking out his powers when hit with a kryptonite bullet or object reduces a godlike alien to just being some Cody clone in a cape. Being affected by kryptonite in-game reduces you to an overdressed and underpowered boxer. That's what ruins the experience across all the Superman games. His own strengths as a character ultimately become his biggest failures in trying to capture them in-game. Had the damage only weakened his abilities and not completely locked them out, there would have been a ton more strategy available to the player, who was instead reduced to wake walking up to people and slamming the X button while they wait for their powers to return. As a game of what would have been, the PlayStation version of Superman held promise and more than likely would have found a foothold where the Batman games couldn't. For as dented as the Superman game is, even in prototype form, it's still light years better than Batman Beyond and Gotham City Racer. There are in it ramblings of a full, finalized retail equivalent ISO being out in the world, but it appears that Titus founder Mark Kane squashed those rumors with his 75 complete comment in one of the interviews. Which brings us full circle back to that part about the sad ending. According to Mark, the PlayStation iteration was coming along fine, but by the time they got that close to finishing it, they'd lost the rights to Superman and all the related characters back to Warner Brothers and DC Comics. With no money left and no way of getting the rights back, Superman was quietly and unceremoniously laid to rest. It was truly a dark side to the character's history. I know that was terrible. So there you have it, one of the PlayStation's saddest tales finally brought to life. I wanted to give a huge shout out, thank you, and high five to everyone involved in this incredible project, including the private owner for the code, Dizzy from Redump.org, all of my Patreon members who made this possible, especially Mike MG who helped me understand the developer lingo, and of course, you. I am extremely honored and humbled to have had this chance and look forward to more prototypes and unreleased games as they come. Oh, one more thing. If you rewatch this video, you may notice it actually unfolds like an instruction manual and a strategy guide for the game, just in case you want to play it for yourself. Be sure to pick yourself up a copy. It'll be available on your local internet sometime soon. All right, guys, that is for the video. Once again, I cannot thank everyone involved. This was just an incredible project, and I don't think I've put this much time into a video game in the amount of time I've had since probably Mass Effect 3. <laughs> so check out the Let's Play video afterwards. Like the video, subscribe, ding the bell, it's all good. If you guys have any questions, I will answer what I can below in the comment section. Otherwise, you can catch me on Twitter and Facebook. Have a great week. I will see you guys in two. Take care.